the judge, they're all in their judge room and about ready to be sent over here, so. You hearing that, Lisa? Is everybody here? Can, can people hear me? Okay. Yes, you're right. Well, we didn't pick a chief justice because the thing that's going around. I think maybe I'll just go ahead and and uh, play that role. Is there is there a, a clerk on uh, on this round or not? Yes, Your Honor. My name is Daniel Harper. I'll be clerking for you today. I, and I believe you actually are supposed to be the Chief Justice, so that works out just fine. Okay, great. Um, and now he's gone. Hello, this is Lisa from Tournament Communications. I just want to make sure that the judges are aware that if your microphone is on, that can cause feedback for the rest of the room. So you'll want to turn it on and off as you speak to the competitors and leave it off while others are speaking. Thank you. I'm back. I clicked on the ballot and that took me away from all of you. So I will just ignore the ballot until after the round is over. So um, if the uh, clerk can go ahead and, and call the case. Of course, Your Honor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Supreme Court of the United States is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Ferris presiding. All those having cause to be before this honorable court, draw an eye and pay heed. God save the United States and God save this honorable court. All right, um, we have a, a case prepared uh, for us and uh, petitioners, are you ready to begin? Petitioner is ready, Your Honor. 
Okay, and respondents, are you ready to begin? The respondent is ready, Your Honor. All right. All right, uh, if the uh, first petitioner uh, speaker can go ahead and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Zacarias Negron, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Thaddean Burson, represent Jason Speed, the petitioner in the case at bar. At this time, I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. That's fine. Thank you, Honor. I will be addressing the issue of the Fourth Amendment violation, while Mr. Burson will be addressing the issue of the Fifth Amendment violation. Your Honors, this court must reverse the erroneous decision of the 14th Circuit Court due to a clear violation of my client's Fourth Amendment protections under respondent's actions. The evidence of this, Your Honors, is twofold. Firstly, a warrant was necessitated, perfectly reasonable, and practicable under the circumstances at bar. Thus, a warrantless search violated my client's Fourth Amendment protections. Second, Mr. Speed's clear and delineated expectation to Fourth Amendment protections was distorted and infringed upon by the search and seizure of the EDR or event data recorder device through a clear distortion of the scope of his consent. Now, Your Honors, in turning to our first line of argumentation, the nature of EDR retrieval as being a search was established and conceded in the lower court proceedings. Thus, we see no reason to raise it here. However, Your Honors, in turning to this court's issue of a warrantless search, we would visit some of the longest established precedent this court has held on the Fourth Amendment. This court unequivocally held in the case of Mapp versus Ohio that searches and seizures conducted without a warrant were unconstitutional, even if conducted <laughs> But consent is a recognized exception. Certainly, Your Honor. And he consented to the search of his entire vehicle, right? Well, Your Honor, petitioners would respectfully disagree that Mr. Speed consented to the search of an EDR device within the vehicle. Oh, I understand that, but he, he, the, the police requested, can, he search, can we search the entire vehicle? And he said yes, right? Your Honor, Mr. Speed did say yes. Okay. And so you're, you're contending that the... Somehow this recording device is different than consenting to the uh, entire vehicle. He, he, he contends, I guess it was, that the passenger compartment, so he didn't consent to a search of the trunk or the glove box? Would he have to consent to those things as well? Your Honor, no. Mr. Speed, after giving consent to search the entire vehicle, would not have to delineate, per se, certain compartments of the vehicle. However, different containers. This court has always afforded and consistently afforded containers, particularly those which are deemed as locked within a vehicle, greater protections. However, Your Honor, before turning to the nature of the container that the EDR device is, I believe it prudent to turn to this court's ruling in Florida versus Jimeno, which establishes the scope of a suspect's consent. What could that blanket consent to search his entire vehicle have meant? In turning there, Your Honors, we see that this court held in 1991 that, quote, the standard for measuring the scope of a suspect's consent under the Fourth Amendment is that of objective reasonableness. They continue to say, what would the typical reasonable person have understood by the okay, example? If, if he would have consented to the search of his house and he, he knew that they were after documents in a file cabinet, um, would he have to consent for them to um, you know, break the lock in the file cabinet? Or? Well, Your Honor, this court has held that there is a firm delineation between searches of one's home and searches of one's vehicle, as there are clear distinctions. We're only talking about the nature of consent here, and there's no difference there, right? Your Honor, I believe that the difference would be that in the case of a filing cabinet within Mr. Speed's home, he would have known of the existence of the files, placed them there expressly by himself, perhaps locked that filing cabinet, and known its exact location. The difference in the case instant is that when we view the situation from an objectively reasonable view, as this court held in Florida versus Jimeno, what would the typical reasonable person have, quote, understood by the exchange between the officer and the suspect, end quote? We would see that Mr. Speed does not know and has testified in trial court hearings to not having known of the existence of the EDR device within the vehicle. Well, counsel, <laughs> is that a reasonable belief? I mean, everyone knows we've had black boxes in planes for decades. They've been around in cars now for years. People check on their teenagers on apps to see if they're speeding. And it's right there in the manual that you've got this thing in your car. So even if he subjectively didn't know, doesn't a reasonable person know this box is in their car? Well, Your Honor, we would respectfully contend that the reasonable person does not know the existence of the EDR device within their vehicle. Unless you are one who is an astute mechanic or an atypical citizen, we would argue that the existence I've of- I've got one. I've got one, and I'm not a mechanic. 
Absolutely, Your Honor. We would argue not that average citizens have this device, but rather that average citizens do not know of the existence of this device within their view. The average citizen- well, Counsel, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So does that mean that the only way for uh, the consent to be lawful is for the officer to specify what he's trying to search? Well, Your Honor, we would contend yes. This court held in Florida versus- So does an officer have to say, I want to go into your room and I want to search this box that's under a bed that he doesn't even know exists? How can they be specific about something they don't know exists? Certainly, Your Honor. I would turn to two precedents held by this court. Firstly, the case of Florida versus Cimeno, in which the officer, investigating officer Trujillo in that case, was granted purview by this court to search the entirety of a vehicle pursuant to a valid blanket consent only because he had expressed the direct object of his consent, the general category of narcotics. He said, may I search your entire vehicle for narcotics? This court held that expressment of that direct object was purview for officer to be Well, I, in, in fairness, counsel, I mean, what the court says is that if you give consent to a search of a vehicle, the police can use that consent to search the vehicle for anything where that might contain drugs, which in that case was a paper bag. So I'm, I'm, I don't see how, I mean, are you, are you seriously saying that the officers have to tell somebody we want to search your vehicle for electronic data before they can search their vehicle for electronic data? Well, Your Honor, we would respectfully contend that respondents may have been able to seize that object out of the vehicle, but not search within it without a Well, second. okay, all right, but that's that's not my question. My, my question is, if this is all about how the officers phrase things, what's the degree of specificity that an officer would have to say in order to give a suspect sufficient notice that they're going to search for EDR? Can he just say electronic data, or does he have to say your EDR device? Well, Your Honor, we would contend the latter, elect or excuse me, the former, ele electronic data within the vehicle. As such, in the case of Officer Trujillo, he did not specify he was searching for cocaine or perhaps marijuana, but rather that he was searching for narcotics, a broad category. In the case of Officer Walker T. Ranger, no such distinction was made. In turning, Your Honors, to the case of United States versus Right, Trump, but I mean, you're the yes, Your Honor. It, is there any case that requires an officer to use magic words when they're asking for consent? Well, Your Honor, this court held in United States versus Ross that a legitimate search is one that establishes the parameters of said search and follows upon that. In the same way, Your Honor, this court held in Florida versus Jimeno. How is an officer going to know what, what they're looking for in the search? Isn't that the purpose of the search? Well, Your Honor, uh, I believe that Mr. Speed is not here to contest an inventory search today, but rather an express search of his EDR device, which was instigated. So you, believe, it, it's, you believe that uh, Mr. Speed was consenting to an inventory search? Well, Your Honor, what I would contend here is that it would be permissible for respondents to seize the device having found it in the vehicle, but they would have been required to receive a further consent to search the data well, upon the Counsel, yard. Let's, let's move past consent and say, look, let, let's say the consent doesn't answer the question here for the sake of argument. Isn't this a pretty easy, inevitable discovery in that the officer could have gotten a warrant I mean, someone just died. This guy drove a car into a crowd. So he would have gotten a warrant anyway for the EDR. So why does it matter? Certainly, Your Honor. Uh, my time has expired. Chief Justice, may I proceed? You can answer this question. Thank you, Your Honor. In answering that question, we would turn to the case of United States versus Ross, which establishes the unequivocal precedent that in cases where a warrant is practicable, where it may be received and issued, it must be used. Now, Your Honor, this court has consistently frowned upon the rulings of Nix versus Williams and Murray versus United States as being the exceptions to the rule. That where inevitable discovery is that inevitable. In that sense, this court has consistently urged the issuance of warrants. For these reasons, Your Honors, we, we urge a reversal of the 14th Circuit Court's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, uh, before your time starts, could you please, since your screen only shows to us your partner's name, could you please tell us your, your, your name and how to spell it? Absolutely, Your Honor. My name is Thadian Burson. That's T-H-A-D-D-I-A-N. And then Burson is B-U-R-S-O-N. Okay. All right. You may begin and the timer should begin. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Thaddean Burson, and I represent Jason Speed, the petitioner on the case at bar with regards to the Fifth Amendment violation of my client's right. 
This court should reverse the decision of the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals because the actions taken by the Paxton State Police Department exceeded the bounds of the Constitution. And this is made evidently clear in two lines of argumentation. First, the action of disclosing the text messages by unlocking the phone is testimonial and thus is protected by the Fifth Amendment. And second, the foregone conclusion exception is inapplicable to the case at bar. Turning to the first line of argumentation, that the compelled unlocking of the phone was testimonial in nature. As this court made clear in Fisher v. United States in 1976, the Fifth Amendment protects information that fulfills three prongs, compulsion, incrimination, and testimony. With regard to the burdens of compulsion and incrimination, they are well established within the facts of the record. Thus, the core inquiry in the case at bar is whether or not compelling speed to unlock his phone is testimonial in nature. Well, counsel, if they didn't get into his brain, I mean, if he were totally passed out in a coma, they could have put his hand against the phone and it still would have opened, right? Yes, Your Honor. So that shows I'm not asking to get into your brain. I'm just looking at your external appearance. In this case, the fingerprint that I, you know, can't see all the grooves on closely with my eyes, but I'm just looking at your external appearance. How is that different from any of the other outside bodily things that are not testimonial? Yes. Your Honor, the court defined the idea of testimony in Doe v. United States in 1988, in which they explained that in order to be testimonial, an accused oral or written communication or act must itself disclose or relate a factual assertion or implicit fact. Now, the question is whether or not unlocking the phone relates an implicit fact to the officers. And the answer is it absolutely does. It implicitly testifies to Speed's possession of the phone. And the core difference between those physical acts, such as a blood sample or a handwriting exemplar, is in that in those physical acts, it is used for identifying purposes only. Looking to the majority opinion of the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals, the lower court, they rely primarily upon the Supreme Court of Minnesota's decision in State v. Diamond. In that decision, the Supreme Court of Minnesota explained that an act is not testimonial when the act is used solely to measure physical properties. However, the action in the case at bar was not used solely to measure physical properties, and that's shown in two ideas. First, compelling the unlocking of the phone discloses the phone's contents as an act of production. As duly noted by the district court- But counsel, they already had a warrant to get to the phone's contents. The yes. only thing that they needed was his, his swirls on his fingertip to open the phone. Yes, Your Honor. However, they were not compelling him simply to look at the physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use the, the analogy I, I used uh, for your partner earlier. If, if they had a warrant for his house and uh, they had, you know, and, and they specified they were going to search a filing cabinet in the house um, and, and he had a, um, a lock on the door or on the, on the cabinet, would it violate the fourth move to, for him them to take bolt cutters and open the cabinet? Well, Your Honor, it would depend on whether or not there was any criminal. Not, I'm sorry. Yes, Your Honor. It would depend on whether or not they compelled him to do so. As such, if they were unlocking it themselves, that would not be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Or, or if they said, produce the key and unlock it. Is that testimony against himself? No, Your Honor. As this court clarified in Dovey, United States, surrendering a key to a lockbox is not testimonial. Okay. Not What's the difference between a finger, finger swipe and, a, and unlocking it? The core difference in the finger swipe is that the individual testifies very clearly that this is, in fact, their phone. With a key, almost anyone can hold the key, and it may or may not be their possession of the law. But nobody doubts this was his phone. This wasn't like they found a phone in a crowd and they were wondering, let's have everybody touch it to see whose it is. Everybody knew it was his phone. They weren't. So how is he telling them an act of identification that this is my phone when they know this is your phone? We have a warrant to search it. It's just like we need this as the key. The key is just glued to your finger. Your Honor, in response to that, we would first look to the United States v. Wright decision by the District Court of Nevada. In the same case, the officers knew that the phone was Wright's, and when they compelled him to unlock it with his face, the court held it that it was testimonial with regards to his possession of the phone regardless. And that's because when you compel an individual to unlock their phone, they nearly authenticate beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is their phone. If not, it is at least within their safety. Counsel, it, it appears that the identity appears to be the uh, number one hangup in regards to uh, this individual's phone. Haven't we previously held that an individual's thumbprints are not testimonial? Thumbprints are used to identify individuals at all. Can you please distinguish those two? Yes, Your Honor. When you're taking a thumbprint, you're looking at the physical characteristics to identify the person. With regards to the act of production in the case at bar, he authenticates the incriminating documents that were produced by unlocking the phone. 
This is actually similar to Hubble the United States in 2000. What's, what's the difference if they're both used for identification purposes? Well, it's used to authenticate the documents that were used to incriminate him. In looking to Hubble the United States in 2000, Your Honor, this court held that it has an act of production when it testifies to the location existence and looking to Fisher possession that is testimonial. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals explained in Doe 2 that when unlocking a phone, excuse me, when an act of production, drawing out the key principles from Hubble and Fisher, conveys implicitly that some documents exist, are in the subpoenaed individual's possession or control, or are authentic. Didn't authentic. we know that these, these uh, documents already existed and that he already provided text messages or exchanged text messages uh, with another individual that had contact with law enforcement? Respectfully, Your Honor, no. The officers had no prior knowledge of the message that they actually found. And that turns us to that second line of argumentation regarding the foregone conclusion doctrine. The only independent evidence that the officers had at a possible text message on Mr. Speed's phone was the testimony given by Ms. Irma Nelson that such a message existed. However, while Mrs. Nelson claimed that she had received said text message, she never provided any evidence of that. Without a claim, without such support, it's most certainly not a foregone conclusion. And this is further strengthened in the fact that once they unlocked the phone, they never found Miss Nelson's text. And so found- my, I, you know, this, this is this is an interesting sort of academic exercise. I guess my my hang up is the only evidence that you're trying to suppress is the text message that says, "I'm going to teach the protesters a lesson." Right? Yes, Your Honor. My question is, if you look at cases like Nix or Gates that reference cases like Milton, don't we have a harmless error issue here? There's, regardless of whether this evidence violates the Fifth Amendment, there's plenty of evidence that the officers got that didn't. They got statements from eyewitnesses, they've got the, the report from the mechanic that the vehicle was in working order. So even if we throw this evidence out, your guy's still gonna be convicted, right? Respectfully, Your Honor, we would disagree. As page seven of the facts and records stipulate, the primary piece of use of evidence that was utilized to incriminate Speed at trial was the text message that they illegally found on his phone. As a result, the suppression of this evidence would change, and this is not would change the case, and this is not harmless error. But even he, though there's a witness that said that he made the exact same statement to her the morning of the event, you're, you're your really point. saying that the that the text message is essential to the conviction. We are contending that the text message was essential to the conviction. However, going back to Irma Nelson's testimony, she claimed that she had received said text message, but was never able to prove it as she claimed that she had also deleted. Well, said counsel, message. even if Nelson's testimony wasn't enough to prove it for a conviction, doesn't that still get you back to inevitable discovery? Because once Nelson said, I got this text from him, I didn't save my own copy, but it's on his phone that would have gotten a warrant, and then they would have just switched and found the other text message. Doesn't the Nelson testimony guarantee they would have gotten to this other text? It's counsel, you may answer the question, even though I assume that, that squeaking is that your time is gone. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the inevitable discovery doctrine only applies when that discovery is in fact inevitable. In other words, the officers have to be inevitably coming upon the discovery of that evidence. The facts of the record never point to any situation in which the officers were actively looking to find the text in another way. As such, that is not applicable to the case at bar. For these reasons, Your Honors, we would urge a reversal of the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals decision. Thank you, Counsel. Responding. Permission to proceed, Your Honor? Yes, as long as you turn on a camera. Yes, sir. Can you see me all right now? Uh, Oh, okay. I had to scroll down. Yes, Ms. Tesh, we can see you. All right, thank you so much. Mr. Chief Justice, Honorable Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Kate Tesh. My co-counsel, Ms. Emily Clancy, and I represent the state of Paxson, the respondent in the case at bar. My co-counsel will be addressing the Fifth Amendment issue. First, I will address the question regarding the Fourth Amendment. The 14th Federal Circuit has rightfully denied Mr. Seed's motion to suppress the data retrieved from his vehicle's event data recorder and has upheld his conviction of voluntary manslaughter. The state concerns this decision should be upheld for the following three core reasons. First, Mr. Speed voluntarily provided consent to the general search of his vehicle. Second, that he has not demonstrated a reasonable expectation of privacy in this data. And third, that the state interest in investigating fatal accidents justifies the admission of this evidence. Beginning with Mr. Speed's consent. Page seven, paragraph six of the record clearly states, quote, Officer Ranger asked Speed for his permission to search the entire vehicle. 
And Speed, according to Officer Ranger, replied with a resounding verbal, of course, end quote. Although Mr. Speed later claimed in the trial of a dentiary hearing that he intended to limit that consent to the passenger compartment of his vehicle, the, si the situation during the on-scene investigation provides zero indication of this intent. To determine whether Officer Ranger's interpretation of said consent was appropriate, the state applies the same test brought forth by opposing counsel, taken from the case of Florida versus Jimeno, that of objective reasonableness. Once again, what would the typical reasonable person have understood by the exchange so between- Counsel, if, if he had had his cell phone left behind in the car instead of in his jeans pocket, and they're searching the car, they find the cell phone, under Riley, they can't search that cell phone even though it's sitting in the car, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And is that the same if he had a laptop sitting in the back seat, which has all the same kind of data as a phone? It's just a little larger? Potentially, Your Honor. Well, why potentially? Uh, I'm trying to figure out, is there a difference between a phone and a laptop? Mine yeah, thinks it has all the same. Correct, so what's the difference between the laptop and this specialized form of what's basically a car specific laptop that's recording all your info that's just under your hood instead of sitting on your back seat. The difference between those two devices, Your Honor, is that while a laptop and a phone conveys extensive personal information about your day to day habits and your entire life, an EDR within your personal vehicle ex um, exposes only approximately 30 seconds of mechanical data about the functioning of your vehicle at the time of the collision. It does not record any information during regular driving, and page 32 of the record, in, which is the taken from Mr. Speed's owner's manual found in his driver's side door, talks about the fact that not only is the installation of the EDR reference, but that manual explicitly informs the owner that this mechanical data is not only exposed to the public, but may be retrieved by law, and law enforcement in the case of a crash investigation. Well, okay, but I mean, but, a, a, an owner's manual can't override the Fourth Amendment. So the fact that the owner's manual says law enforcement can get this. I, I'm more interested, though. You, your, your claim is that this doesn't record anything until a collision? Correct, Your Honor. So how does that happen if a collision occurs and there's no recording until the collision occurs? How does the EDR capture the 30 seconds before the collision? Well, Your Honor, while I'm not a mechanic, according to the facts of the record, the EDR starts recording this information when it senses very sudden breaking, maybe a spin out, some kind of circumstances that would occur in a serious collision. Page 32 of the record specifies that no data are recorded by the EDR under normal driving conditions. So, so if, I'm a, if I'm a lead foot and I brake frequently because I'm going too fast, this could be capturing my data? Not necessarily, Your Honor. I believe the circumstances would have to be very, very extreme in order for the EDR to start recording. But once again, no matter when it's if we disagree, if we disagree and this is just a continuous 30 second looping of all the stuff and it erases itself and collects 30 seconds of new stuff and it does that every day that you drive the car, every time you drive the car, does that change the case at all? No, Your Honor, because in that case, the EDR would not be functioning as intended. And once again, it would not be a major issue before this court because the EDR. To the fact, I think we understood the answer to Justice Kamaka Vivole's question. But l let me ask you, if it's if it's triggered by sudden braking, the the evidence of the EDR said there was no braking. It stopped when he hit a pole. So what triggered it here? And, I have to go back, you know. You know, he he hit the gas and he went. And according to you, the recording shouldn't have, shouldn't have started. I apologize if I misrepresented the issue, Your Honor. I'm not sure that sudden break-in is the only circumstance in which an EDR's recording could be triggered. But once again, any circumstances indicating a crash trigger this recording. However, this is not any invasion of Mr. Speed's privacy or infringement upon his personal effects, which are protected. Oh, so you just an invasion of a privacy, but. You're uh, recommending to the court that we allow information of what an individual does only when it is bad for the past 30 seconds or so, that they don't have an expectation of privacy in that matter. So if an individual has a, has a camcorder that only records um, them when they <clears throat> engage in some behavior that is criminal, that they don't have an expectation of privacy in that. 
I'm not aware that any such camcorder exists currently, Your Honor. However, several lower courts have reached varying versions of the same conclusions with regard to this mechanical data. We see in the cases of People versus Quackenbush, People versus Chrisman, and People versus Diaz, that all of them found that the defendants in those cases could not demonstrate a reasonable expectation of privacy in activities such as speed and braking, which they knowingly reveal to the public eye in operating a vehicle as an owner. They assume but some level of- didn't Jones reject that same thinking about the GPS? Everyone said, arguing that case, well, you're already revealing to the public which roads you're going on and where you're turning, and a cop could have just followed you for hours and hours and gotten the same info. But the court said, no, even though that's exposed to the public, we're still going to protect GPS data. So why doesn't that undercut that for EDR? Because, Your Honor, there's a major distinction between the type of trespass theory applied in United States versus Jones and the doctrines that apply in this case. In the case of Jones, the Federal Bureau of Investigation installed a GPS tracking device on Jones's vehicle for the purpose of tracking him over a period of 28 days. Here, the government did not install any device that was meant to intrude upon Mr. Speed's privacy or reveal location information about him. The EDR was already present in his vehicle at the time of production. It was installed... I, 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 I have a I have a feeling, you know, I, the, the, the record is pretty clear. This is not just something that you can pop open and take the tape out of. You have to use specialized equipment to get in. You need specialized training to get this. This seems a lot more akin to cracking a safe to me. And you're not going to, I mean, if you go into somebody's house and you crack open a safe, I think you're going to have a hard time saying that you're not trespassing. Of course, Your Honor. As Justice Berger pointed out in Opperman, first of all, circumstance warrantless searches of automobiles have been upheld in many circumstances in which a search of something within a home would not. And second of all, we see that in this case, there has not been the kind of expectation of privacy. Counsel, so it, are you reporting to the court that anything an officer finds within a, a lawful search of a car, they can seize it and then search it without further warrants? Not at all, Your Honor. But law enforcement well, has what's sufficient. different between an officer that finds a gun safe or finds another uh, device that appears to be incriminating? How do you uh, decide for the two? Because a gun safe would contain contents purposely protected by the defendant and placed there purposefully. In this case, this was not a locked container. It was something that the that the peti petitioner, pardon me, was unaware of. And it was not something that Katz would have recognized as demonstrating a subjective or reasonable expectation. But if he's, if he's unaware of and that uh, lack of awareness is reasonableness, then his consent is, is invalid. Respectfully, I would disagree, Your Honor. This court has never established precedent that determines that law enforcement is responsible for establishing exact boundaries on a search conducted with consent. You can't have it both ways, counsel. Either, you know, either it's it's not like a safe because, you know, he didn't know it was there. He wasn't trying to hide it. But if he didn't know it was there and he didn't try to hide it, and it's reasonable that he didn't know that, then he didn't consent to it. Because if, if it's reasonable to assume that he didn't know it, how can it be, how can you use that information against him? This court has not shown significant concern for a defendant's knowledge of something contained within a vehicle in the past. If we turn to the case of United States versus Caro, referenced by Scalia in his opinion in the case of United States versus Jones, we see that this court has held in the past that a beeper installed within a car without the knowledge of the car's current operator and only with the knowledge of the original owner was valid and the government could use that but device. That, but that, again, that's, that's, that, I mean, that case is like apples and oranges. I, I don't know how that helps you because you're, you're talking about the, the government did not install the beepers in Cairo. That was key to the court's conclusion. And then once the government gets involved and the government's doing the one doing the safe cracking or the doing the installation, you're in Jones land. You're not in Cairo. That's correct, Your Honor, because there is an even less significant invasion of privacy in this circumstance where the government was already accessing available information revealed to the public. My time has expired. May I finish that sentence and briefly conclude? No, because I'm going to ask you a question and then you can briefly conclude. Uh, the, the question I want to ask you is about it's something you didn't get to because we peppered you with questions. You said that there, a third reason that we should grant you um, uh, a, a affirmance today is because there's a, the state interest in the uh, search was so important that it justified it. Since when does the importance of the or the gravity of the crime 
justify an illegal search? When, when did a balancing test kind of criteria enter into the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence? Yes, Your Honor. That point was in reference to the lower court case of People versus Quackenbush, which determined that the expectation of privacy in a vehicle's data is significantly diminished by the fact that the government has a public safety interest in determining the cause of the accident. This accident killed an 18-year-old student and Paxson State Police was simply following product protocol and fulfilling their responsibility. For those reasons, Your Honor, we request that this court uphold the ruling of the 14th Circuit. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice, may I proceed? Yes, Ms. Clancy, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chief Justice, Honorable Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Emily Clancy, and I will address the issue of the Fifth Amendment. The 14th Federal Circuit Court rightly found that compelling Mr. Speed to unlock his cell phone via fingerprint scan did not violate his Fifth Amendment rights. We believe that the decision of that court must be upheld for three primary reasons. First, the act of unlocking a cell phone via fingerprint scan is not inherently testimonial. Second, the search and seizure of the incriminating text message found on Mr. Speed's cell phone is not a Fifth Amendment concern. Third and finally, the only thing Mr. Speed communicated by unlocking the phone was that he knew it belonged to him. His ownership of the phone was already known to the government and therefore it was a foregone conclusion. But first, the simple act of unlocking a cell phone via fingerprint scan is not testimonial in nature. The Fifth Amendment is intended according Counsel, to... Counsel, what if he had, instead of a fingerprint uh, passcode, and they just said, give us those four or six digits, would that be testimonial? Because he'd have to speak and tell you the numbers in his head? Your Honor, the lower courts, according to page 16 of the record, are divided on the issue of whether or not a passcode to a cell phone is considered testimonial. This issue was dealt specifically with by the, uh, by the court in State versus Stahl, which found that there was no violation inherent in compelling a passcode because it was analogous to providing a biometric scan. And the court in that case specifically observed that the national consensus was that biometrics were not considered testimonial. Another case that handled... Should we agree that a bat with those courts below that said a passcode is not testimonial? Your Honor, within a ruling in favor of respondent, that option would be available to this court to draw a bright line, either stating that it is not a Fifth Amendment violation to compel a suspect to open a cell phone at all, or that it is only not a violation in terms of path, in terms of excuse me, biometrics specifically. Well, I guess what I'm confused by is I'm concerned either way, because if we say we could also get to a passcode then that does meet the traditional definition of testify about something in your head. I mean, for example, if he were passed out, we couldn't ask him, hey, what's your password or your passcode? But on the other hand, if we draw a distinction, then it seems like whether someone's Fourth Amendment rights are honored or Fifth Amendment rights are honored turns totally upon the coin flip of which method they use to do the same thing. So either answer seems a little silly to me. So the easiest answer is just to rule against you. Your Honor, even if the act of opening a cell phone could have otherwise been considered testimonial, there is still no violation in the instant case because the only thing Mr. Speed proved by unlocking the cell phone was that he knew it belonged to him, which was a foregone conclusion. Fisher versus United States from this court established foregone conclusion doctrine, ruling that the government can compel production of evidence when that evidence adds little yeah, or nothing. Not a foregone conclusion unless you can show that you can hack past his password. Because, I mean, is it the, the 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 finger swipe doesn't actually open the phone the finger swipe unlocks the password and then the password is supplied to the phone isn't that how it works not in this case your honor uh, that would be a case in which a passcode was needed to open the cell phone but, but, but passcodes are always needed to open cell phones um not just, necessarily the, the, the way well at least the way my phone works is that when i put my thumbprint on it it that app supplies the password to the phone and the password opens the phone. So the, it's like a double lock. The password unlocks the passcode. Excuse me, the thumbprint unlocks the passcode. Isn't that how it works here? Your Honor, that is the case with some cell phones. However, with many modern cell phones, including that of Mr. Speed, all that is needed to unlock the cell phone is a fingerprint scan. The phone identifies the fingerprint of the user who has programmed their fingerprint into the cell phone, and the contents are revealed automatically without the use of a passcode. Therefore, we see in the case at bar that all Mr. Speed had to do was scan his fingerprint. He did not have just to reveal. A, just a factual clarification question, counsel. I'm, I'm perusing the record, and I'm, I'm obviously not as familiar with it as you guys are, but I don't see any 
discussion in the record about how this particular phone works. Your Honor, if, if, if the phone works in the way as Chief Justice Ferris says his works, would that change the analysis if this becomes a proxy for the path? It, you, this allows the phone to automatically enter the password. Your Honor, first a point of clarification, paragraph, or excuse me, page six, paragraphs four and five uh, can help to clarify this issue as far as how Mr. Speed's phone in particular works. And secondly, that may change this court's analysis of the issue as far as where to draw a bright line task, whether this court- Okay, well, uh, so, so pages six, four, four and five is where I'm looking. There is, as far as I can tell, no particular um, discussion about how this swiping works that would rule out what Chief Justice Ferris has said. Because the answer could change, and because the, the, the nature of the phone is important, shouldn't we just remand and get that factual question clarified? Because we can't answer the question unless we know how the phone works, right? That's not necessary in the case at bar, Your Honor, because page six, paragraph, I believe five in particular of the record states that Mr. Speed scans his thumbprint and then the phone opens. That's how my phone works. That's how many modern cell phones work. However, even if we weren't sure exactly how Mr. Speed's phone worked, the only thing he would have proven by unlocking it was that he knew it belonged to him, which the government already knew. Law enforcement had seized the phone from his person and even- But I mean, you, 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 you admit the phone contains all sorts of stuff. And I mean, the, that same, Paragraph five that you're referencing says, as soon as they open the phone, the officers begin scrolling through the phone to look for information. There's no question the phone contains testimony, right? Right, Your Honor. Okay, so here's my question. In Miranda, we recognized years and years and years ago, the start of this whole thing, that there are risks to compelling testimony. The risk is terrible because it taints everything that we value about due process if you can compel testimony. And we decided, rather than trying to parse through all the fine lines about what the Fifth Amendment may or may not require in every single circumstance, it's just better to create a broad prophylactic rule that will keep officers on the right side of the Fifth Amendment line, whatever that line is. You have to give the statements, got to tell everybody, you know, your statements you, you make can be used against you, you have a right to a lawyer, all that other stuff, all prophylactic. Because cell phones contain as we pointed out in Riley, so much information that's inherently testimonial. Why wouldn't we do what we did in Riley and what we did in Miranda and say, phones are a special case. If you wanna access the information on a phone, you need, you cannot compel access to the phone because we're concerned that this is gonna unlock tons of testimony and frankly make obtaining real testimony completely unnecessary. Your Honor, I have two responses to your question. Firstly, that would be a Fourth Amendment concern. In fact, the only valid concern petitioner could to, could attempt to raise writing the text message itself would be a Fourth Amendment concern, similar to the case of Riley versus California. Well, However, that's, that, that's not true. I mean, if he's got a, a, a record of a phone conversation, that's testimonial. You can't compel him to produce that, can you? Your Honor, the reason there's no Fifth Amendment violation here is because of my second response to your earlier question, which is that this court has actually dealt with that issue before, not specifically regarding cell phones, but regarding the production of testimonial evidence. In the case of United States versus Hubble, this court found that a person may be compelled to produce incriminating testimonial evidence if the creation of that evidence was not compelled. Opposing counsel brought forth the test from Fisher that states that evidence must be compelled, incriminating, and testimonial. Mr. Speed was not compelled to write this text message, therefore under precedent from Fisher and Hubble, he can be compelled to produce it, as long as the act of production Where not Where does that stop though? I mean, the vast majority of communication that we create, and maybe all of it, is not compelled. That's is there any is there anything that you can be refused that, that that you is there anything left that's protected by the Fifth Amendment then? Of course, Your Honor. In fact, Mr. Speed, I'm sure I gather that officers would have liked for him to confess outright to his crimes. However, he was able to assert his Fifth Amendment rights in not doing that. However, the use of the text message itself, this is a text message that Mr. Speed chose to send, one that he knew would be incriminating. And the fact that it was found on his personal private cell phone is a Fourth Amendment concern that he has elected not to raise. Likely so it, so it, it, it occurs to me then that if this, if this is true, this position, the government has no incentive to seek search warrants for phones anymore, right? Your Honor, All they need to do, they can get the exact same information by just saying, give us your fingerprint. 
and we'll get into the phone. We don't need a warrant to enter. Your Honor, there's an essential. You, you, I just want to make sure you understand the swath of information that you're laying open to the state. I don't see how there's any limit to what the government can access at this point. Of course, Your Honor. What's important to understand about the case at Barr is that this was not a warrantless search of Mr. Speed's cell phone. Police officers sought a warrant and the judge chose to grant them one. That's likely the reason why Mr. Speed has chosen not to raise a Fourth Amendment concern. To clarify, wasn't it a, a, um, a warrant to compel, not a warrant to search? Your Honor, it was a warrant to compel Mr. Speed to open the cell phone for the purposes of searching that cell phone for a text message like the incriminating one they had an eyewitness account of. Irma Nelson told them that she had. Your Honor, I see that my time has expired. May I finish my sentence and briefly conclude? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Irma Nelson stated that she had received such a text message. Therefore, police officers knew that at least one such message existed and, um, and excuse me, sought a warrant in order to search the phone to find it. Your Honors, for all these foregoing reasons, we see that Mr. Speed's rights have not been violated, and we respectfully request that this court uphold the decision of the 14th Federal Circuit. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Which one of you is going to be doing rebuttal? Oh, it looks like it's Mr. Negron. Yes, Your Honor. Permission okay. to proceed? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice and Associate Justices. We would begin our rebuttal in turning to the issue of the Fourth Amendment. Aligning the long lines of argumentation presented by respondents was that of a state interest. Petitioners find this argument neither binding nor persuasive, as it would lead to a slippery slope in which any circumstances of ambiguity of state interest would lead to the uncovering of information that could be incriminating and detrimental to one's case in court. But further, Your Honors, we would turn to another linchpin of respondents' arguments, that of the expectation to privacy test. Here we would see that the expectation to privacy test established by Justice Harlan in Katz versus United States, it leads to simply a binary conclusion, that of whether or not a search has occurred. If Mr. Speed's privacy interests were infringed, a search had occurred. This question is not before the court today as respondents and petitioners and the lower court's reasoning all concur. A search has indeed occurred. The core inquiry in the case at bar today is whether or not proper procedure was followed, whether or not a warrant must have been procured. As such, Your Honors, we would turn to the issue of a warrant being necessitated. This court unequivocally held in United States versus Ross that in cases where a warrant is reasonably practical. This argument just completely overlooks the consent issue. Certainly, Your Honor. In and so, you know, um, I, 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 I believe that the, the reasonableness test still applies to the extent of the consent, does it not? Certainly, Your Honor. However, a different reasonableness test, that of the Jimeno test of an objective expectation, or excuse me, an objective reasonability of what was understood between the exchange by the officer and the suspect. And Your Honor, in turn- Because they have searched his brakes? Your Honor, uh, this court has not it's held- according, according to his consent, can I search your entire car? And they, you know, can they look at his brakes to see if his brakes were malfunctioning? Your Honor, we would believe that that would be an infringement of, or a distortion, excuse me, of the scope of Mr. Speed's consent. Well, I mean, they knew he, you know, he claimed that there had been a, a sudden acceleration and a, a mechanical failure of his car. And so they were looking for uh, evidence relative to the mechanical failure of a car. It, it would seem reasonable that they're going to be looking at the gas pedal, the, you know, the brakes, all the ignition, all those things the transmission, all those things would be examined, right? Well, Your Honor, we would respectfully disagree as we look at the circumstances. Well, what are they consenting to? I mean, what, is it, what could they possibly be looking for other than mechanical information when he's contending the car just jumped through the crowd all on its own? Well, Your Honor, Mr. Speed is of the, he is of the persuasion that the search was one of his passenger compartment and the general area is generally searched by police. Well, what would they be looking for? Your Honor, perhaps narcotics, perhaps if Mr. Speed had been driving a vehicle. Counsel, if the whole question here is, the cop says, what happened? He says, oh, my car just accelerated out of nothing. Gee, I guess we're going to look in the back seat to see if you had a bag of pot. H how does that match up? Of course they're going to look into acceleration because he claimed sudden acceleration. To say, oh, they might be looking for what, a bloody glove in the back seat? Well, I don't I understand, understand that. Well, Your Honor, there may have been other circumstances that led to Mr. Speed's erratic behavior, such as driving under the influence. Mr. Counsel, Speed can you point to anything in the record that supports that assertion? 
Certainly, Your Honor. Mr. Speed sat idle in his vehicle for several minutes in front of the Paxson State uh, University crowd of protesters. As okay, such, wasn't that because he would stop? Your Honor, it was because he would stop. No, but, well, why is there here? any, what, what other reason is he sitting in his car for? Is well, he supposed Honor, to be in the park? Well, Your Honor, Mr. Speed did not attempt to communicate with the protesters or attempt to... So he's supposed to get out and address these uh, violent protesters? Your Honor, what, Your Honor, respectfully, that is not my contention. My contention is that Mr. Speed and the circumstances surrounding him may have included some cause for police to search the vehicle for other objects generally... Your Honor, my time has expired. May I briefly conclude? Please finish your answer to this question. Thank you, Your Honor. We would believe that Mr. Speed was under the impression, as he has testified, that a search would have been through the general parameters of a police search, that of a passenger compartment, and searching for general issues which are inventoried in such searches. For such a reason, Your Honors, we would urge the reversal of the 14th Circuit Court's decision. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. The case is under advisement. We'll fill out our ballots, and you guys will find out shortly. Uh, I'll, I'll just prematurely say, you guys are all outstanding. So, um, anyway, we'll, 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 I, I assume we'll come back and, and give feedback there. All right. The Honorable Court is now adjourned. Counselors and spectators will please wait for the justices to exit. Great round, y'all, and congratulations. Yeah. Fantastic job. Yes, well done, y'all. Great job. Congratulations. Have a great rest of your day. You guys as well.